Hello and welcome to the Second Tier Preview Show brought to you by SBK. I'm Ryan Dilks and I'm joined by the Mo Salah to my Emilio Ensue. It's Justin Peach. Good day to you, Ryan. Justin, I think this is possibly the first time Emilio Ensue has been mentioned on the show, but with good reason. He's scored a hat-trick in the African Cup of Nations for Equatorial Guinea. Of course, Emilio Ensue, formerly of Middlesbrough and Birmingham. It's just incredible. It's fantastic, isn't it? I was um, I was going to bring him up earlier on in the day prior to recording and just mention it because it's such he's such a random name because he he was um, it was highly rated by supporters, but he didn't pull up trees by by any means. Did he have a loan spell at Blackburn as well? I'm sure he did. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure he endeared himself to Blackburn supporters as well. Um, but nonetheless, he was he was loved by by Borough supporters, and scoring a hat trick at an international tournament is an incredible incredible feat. And. But this is the craziest thing. I had to read this twice because I thought this cannot be right. It's the first hat trick at the African Cup of Nations in 16 years, which <laughs> seems very strange considering the tournament's like every two years. How is this the first hat trick in so long? And it's and by also, Emilio Ensue. <laughs> I was going to say, and also, no disrespect to Emilio Ensue, but the standard of strikers in those. Uh, 16 years, did you say? Sami Eto'o, uh, Didier Drogba, Mo Salah, just a wealth of attackers playing international football at the African Cup of Nations over the years. Yeah. And he, uh, Emiliano, uh, Emilio Ensue is the first one to, to score a hat-trick in that time. It's just absolutely outstanding. <laughs> so <laughs> random, isn't it? Anyway, Justin, um, we're doing this preview show brought to you by SBK. I'm live from Cyprus. Are you going to ask you me how, how the journey was getting here? I presume it was fine. you living breathing in front of me so you got there safely and yeah. um, to be honest no one no one needs to know um what your holiday is like because it's okay. mainly going to be bitterness from everybody because it's minus three in the uk and you're going to a nice sunny place where there's where there's no frost at all yeah 20 degrees is here lovely it's very very nice when we got off the plane it was oh superb um just it is a question for you and this blew my mind what well, what would you say is the biggest faff you have to deal with at an airport? Um, dealing with partners. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not what I was expecting you to say. What would you say the second biggest faff is? Um, getting, well, the obvious one is getting stuff into your clear bag, your liquid into your clear bag. Yes, your yes. Mil. That's that exactly what I wanted you to say. So we went through Stansted Airport, didn't have to take anything out of the bag. Didn't have to take liquids or anything like that. Didn't have to take electronics anything out the back they they have this new device this new technology which means they can just do it you just plunk your bag on the what's it they scan it through fine it was unbelievable that's incredible airport talk right here but you are right it is a genuine fact and even just taking a laptop you have to get everything out yeah and it's the bane of my life because i take well i've, I've, I've recorded from italy i've recorded from mexico i've recorded from everywhere taking mic headphones laptop laptop charger all out of your bag and trying to put it all back in again before a flight it's genuinely, it just gives me so much anxiety and stress. It ruins my trip. Well, it might not be a thing anymore based off this uh, this apparent technology development, which has happened at Stansted Airport. Wouldn't have happened without Brexit. There we go. Uh, why did you have Technical, to say that? <laughs> t- technical advances, that's what it is. <laughs> well, this is me recording from Cyprus, and it's the long line of us recording this podcast in various locations around the world. And you know what? We're still doing it, aren't we, Justin? That's the loyalty that we give to this podcast. And that's why we are the number one championship podcast, the second tier. Welcome along, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. Yes, this is the preview show brought to you by SBK. So we're going to be making some predictions in this show. We're going to be talking about our game of the weekend, which is Stoke v Birmingham. People may be thinking... Surely it's Leicester v Ipswich, but it is on Monday night, so we're going to have a little preview on that on Sunday's episode. And as I say, we're going to be making our bankers and our outsider predictions later on in the show as well. Also got a bit of transfer news with the Millwall signing a defender from Tottenham Hotspur, which we'll also touch on. And then we'll finish off with Scott High or Ryan Lowe right at the end of the show. So as I say, our game of the weekend is a meeting between two new managers in the championship as Stoke face Birmingham on Saturday afternoon. Tony Mowbray's second league game in charge of Blues, whereas Stephen Schumacher has been there a bit longer than that, but very much old school v new school in terms of championship bosses. And Stoke have home advantage here, Justin, and uh, having a bit of a good start to Schumacher, aren't they? Unbeaten in five league games so far. They were also unbeaten in both games under caretaker boss Paul Gallagher, 
which means this seven league game unbeaten run is their longest since March 2019. So with that being said, Justin, how impressed have you been with Stoke? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I don't think I've been impressed. I've been sort of, you know, gazing from afar and thinking, okay, this is, this is all right. This is better. Um, because it's been steady. It's just been steady. It's not been outstanding. It's not been brilliant, but it's been steady. It's been better than it was as well under Alex Neil, which is an important thing to point out because it was really, really bad. And there are various reasons to that. I think the big thing is the relationship Schumacher is developing with the supporters as well, which is, which is a huge, huge aspect because let's be honest, um, Alex Neil wasn't, you know, wasn't full of character <laughs> um, to, to put it. It wasn't full of personality. Um, you know, so they're different personalities. And I think that's a big thing as well. I think it's going to endear yourself to the squad quicker. Um, and we're starting to see that because we haven't seen, you know, a full Stephen Schumacher side where his team's full throttle. They've been quite cautious. They've been quite rigid. No, not rigid, but they've been quite, um, not defensive minded, but certainly more leaning towards that side. They're keeping clean sheets, keeping opposition, opposition out and they're managing games better, which is a huge, huge step forward for Stoke because, they haven't really done that probably since Mike O'Neill's initial spell in charge. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Well, considering how up and down they were under Alex Neil, mainly down, I think this, <laughs> I think this uh, bit of consistency is a good thing for Stoke. Huge. I don't think they've played particularly well during this run, though. Of the seven games unbeaten, only two of them have been wins. And they were against a Rotherham side who, were virtually, who we've virtually relegated already. And actually Birmingham, of course playing them this weekend, who, as we all know, were awful under Wayne Rooney. And there have been some very good draws in there. We will give them credit for that. Ipswich, they held to a goalless draw and got a point away at West Brom, which is no mean feat. So those two are excellent results, in fairness. It's definitely an improvement on what it was under Alex Neil, but I wouldn't go and hail Stephen Schumacher as the Messiah just yet. Yeah, you're right. I think the best analogy I can give is, yeah, to fix a leak in your bathroom you've got to rip up some floorboards you've got to take some panels off the walls um, it's not going to be pretty it's going to be pretty messy getting there obviously you don't have any knowledge of DIY because you are a cushioned cushioned man you have no idea how this how this lifestyle is but are you talking to me are you <laughs> I am talking to you absolutely 100% talking to you but um, you know you've got to pull panels off the wall you've got to dig things out um, uh, to, to fix the leak and that's what Schumacher is doing um, and, and those initial stages aren't going to be pretty but my god when he gets that new bathroom suite it's going to look nice Ooh. well we shall see it depends how good of a plumber Stephen Schumacher is doesn't it I suppose <laughs> but uh, yeah it, it's been a it's been a solid start it hasn't it I think exactly. that's the that's the very least you can say meanwhile Birmingham they got a draw in their first game under big mobs after a very late equaliser from Jordan James and then they followed that up with another late show in their win against Hull in the FA Cup scoring the winner in the 93rd minute and keep that in mind we have got to remember how on their arse Birmingham have been under Wayne Rooney. So the draw against Swansea and the win in the Cup, they will do wonders for confidence, won't they? Because that confidence will have been six feet under after Rooney's, Rooney's reign, won't it? Yeah. yeah, it goes without saying. I mean, you've only got to look at the character. It's a very cliche thing in football, but just looking at the character of the teams, you know, to, they, they, they pummeled Swansea in Mowbray's first game. They pummeled Swansea. They should have been three ahead at least by half time and they weren't they were missing chances um, and then obviously Swansea took you know scored twice they were 2-1 ahead and obviously scoring late as well it takes a lot of characters to come back from that and then scoring late again in, in the FA Cup it's you know, it's good it's good momentum it's good habits that are forming under Mowbray and again character didn't exist under Wayne Rooney it existed under John, John Eustace but character did not exist under Wayne Rooney he drained the team of, of, of quality and character by, by trying to play a certain way it just wasn't comfortable for the group that he had at his, um, at his uh, disposal but what we're seeing with Mowbray I know it's only been two games it's only been a few weeks but we're seeing confidence come back into the players and once the team gets confident they are a really good side they're a mid-table side at the very least they can maybe flirt with the playoffs not this season but you know if things didn't go awry with, with Rooney they, they could have been flirting with the playoffs so um, yeah I think Mowbray's done a, 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 a he's done what we expected him to do and he's raised those players up and it could continue against Stoke yeah well it's two games so we shouldn't get too carried away but we all know what Mowbray's about he's a good man manager and he's a very solid operator at this level and given time I'm sure he will do what he has done with pretty much every job he has had at this level and that is leave a club in a better place than exactly. when he came in can't have been 
<laughs> too much difficult. <laughs> they can't get much worse than where they were when Rooney was uh, when Rooney left. But uh, you get my point. He's a very, very good man manager, and he also loves his food, doesn't he? Do, did you see the clip of him talking about the buffet at Birmingham? That's top tier mobs, isn't it? It's top tier mobs. He's just a just a sound guy, an amazing guy. Um, and I tell you what, I I um, I want to see him have his own documentary series. You know, we just, we're talking about Sunderland until I die in our previous episode. Netflix documentary, of, well, not documentary, but you know, Netflix series of Tony Mowbray going around football grounds checking out Scran. Are we up for that? <laughs> Tony Mowbray might be behind the Footy Scran account on Twitter. Yes, yes, <laughs> you may be onto something there, Justin. That sounds. <laughs> I think you you you've caught onto the the person behind it now because that, that Mowbray. it fits him down to a T, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's five star food, and that's all you know. The Footy Scran account is, is really into. Obviously, they do uh, they do put out some 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 uh, horror shows. But Tony Mowbray is the man for. I don't think there's any football managers in the Championship that I can remember who've, who've talked about food as often as he has. I know we've only mm. we've gone from Revels to you know five star. I don't know buffet. Was it a buffet at the um, the press meeting? Nonetheless, you know he's he's a man who knows his food. He reviews food. So let's let's uh, let's pitch this idea to. Um, Streaming services. Let's get him yeah. around. Someone feed yeah. Tony. Well, he knows his food. Let's see how much we know about our predictions, Justin, because it's time for our second tier bet builder with SBK. And with SBK, you can curate your own bet builder with a range of markets for any championship game. It's easy, fast and secure on the SBK mobile app. And you'll find substantially better odds there than at any other bookmaker. So every Friday, we're making our own bet builder with four selections, all relating to our game of the week. So that's two for Justin and two for me. Justin, what are your selections? I've gone with the full-time result to be a draw and Jordan Thompson to get carded. Um, I think going with the draws first. Schumacher's obviously in three draws so far in his six games. They've been steady eddies in the league. Uh, and while obviously Schumacher gets to grips with the new side, I imagine... I imagine it'll be the same with Mowbray and Birmingham as well. Um, but I think Schumacher's yet to get his attack firing. That's pretty obvious because they just don't create chances at the moment, or not too many chances. So I expect it to be a close game, and um, I think both sides lack a, a lack a match winner at the moment. But it could be could be a, you know an overwhelming tie. But I'm expecting it to be to be occasion one. And Jordan Thompson, he's been starting games under Schumacher, um, but he's been booked seven times in the league uh, this season in 17 games. I mean, it's no surprise considering Ben Pearson is at the club, so he's he's got yeah, a bit of a role model, a role model, a bad influence at the club to uh, <laughs> to, 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 to pay to, to pay fouls. So coming up against some players in Birmingham who like to play on the break, I'm, I'm expecting plenty of professional fouls in this game. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I never just really ben, thought of... just just Ben Thompson in Jordan. No, sorry, Ben Pearson in Jordan Thompson's is go on, get booked. Go on. <laughs> Go on, let's see if we can get more yellow cards. That's what it would be. I, uh, I never thought of Ben Pearson as such a bad influence, but now you have convinced me. It didn't take much to convince me, but it sounds about right. <laughs> At my selections, I'm going for under 2.5 goals. The reason for that is only one of Stoke's last eight league games has featured over 2.5 goals. Not been very high scoring recently, so that one is basically makes sense based off what we've seen recently with them. And then I've gone for Birmingham's highest scoring half to be the second half. As mentioned just a second ago, Birmingham have scored late on in both of Mowbray's games in charge so far. So if this is going to be a tight one, like I expect it to be, I think Birmingham will squeeze something out of it as the game goes on. So that's what we've gone for. We've gone for full-time result to be a draw, Jordan Thompson to get carded, under 2.5 goals, and Birmingham's highest scoring half to be the second half. And a £10 bet on that with SBK returns £420. Ooh, £420. Jesus, Justin. Uh, new Trip SBK. to Cyprus. Yes. <laughs> New SBK users can take advantage of £30 in free bets when you place your first £10 bet. T's and C's apply over 18s only. And please do gamble responsibly. Just before we get on to the rest of our predictions, Justin, a bit of transfer news for you. And Millwall have signed defender Jaffet Tanganga on loan from Tottenham Hotspur until the end of the season. I looked at this one. I thought that's a decent move. I say that because... I remember him getting quite a bit of hype and playing fairly regularly for Spurs not too long ago. I think I'm yeah. thinking around COVID time. So the fact he's now dropping down to the Championship for Millwall, I think that's a very solid move. I think it is a solid move. I think Millwall have got a really good track record as well of bringing in um, lonely defenders. Obviously, Dan Ballard's come come through the the, 
the books or the, the temporary books at Millwall and so too as Charlie Cresswell and had good seasons at the Den. I think Jaffa Tanganga as well, he's in a position where he needs to reignite his career because it has fizzled out a bit. As you mentioned, he was he was playing for Spurs um, fairly regularly, always involved fairly regularly. I think it was under Jose Mourinho, wasn't it? So it would have been the, the COVID the COVID time. And, um, you know, I think game time has come, come few and far between since then. Um, so, yeah, he, he's a player who needs to... Um, to get back into it, shall we say? Because there's a lot of potential there, a lot of potential. Um, you know, he can be a bit uh, rough around the edges at times, but I think that's a, a you know a good trait for a, for a Millwall defender, especially under Joe Edwards, who's who's going to want to play a high pressing system. I think Tanganga is going to going to want to get involved in that as well. So I think it's a good move for all parties, really, because Tanganga needs to reignite, uh, reignite his career, and Millwall need a defender. Well, it's interesting that I believe there's no option to buy, which would say to me Tottenham still think he's got a future of some sort at the club. Mm, yeah. And we've got to keep in mind, he's 24. So, you know, I say he's getting on a bit. Um, 24 <laughs> is by, he's no slouch in that respect. Oh, it's but, a dream. <laughs> well, I, I say, I, I say that because he's obviously no slouch being 24, but, you know, he's not the youngster that he was when he was yeah. playing at Spurs before. So whether he does have a future or not, only time will tell, but this is, I suppose, his last chance to show what he's all about. But I think it's a really solid sign for Millwall. Can play at centre back and right back, can't he? And you are quite right. Millwall have, uh, have had got a, a, quite a decent record of developing defenders, so it seems like a good move for him. Whether he plays at right back or centre back, I'm not too sure. I think centre back is probably the most likely option. But yeah, seems like a, a very, very solid move. When I saw it, it raised my eyebrows. I've got to say. Yeah, yeah, and I think as well, got to remember that Sean Hodgson's getting on a bit. Jake Cooper's never been the quickest and also he's getting towards his 30s as well um, so to inject a little bit of I say youth someone below the age of 30 I think is a, is, is a good is a good um, is a good way to go about it because as I say Millwall are probably in that position where they do need to recruit younger players and I know it's not a permanent signing but getting legs into that team I think is going to be important especially at the back where Joe Overs may want to deploy a high press style of play want to push that defensive line a little bit further forward maybe Tanganga helps out a little bit yeah, I think that's absolutely spot on, Justin. Let's take a quick break. After that, we'll make our predictions for the weekend. Welcome back to the Second Tier Podcast. So let's have a look ahead to the weekend then. And in each preview episode of the Second Tier, just tonight we'll each pick a banker, a team we think is guaranteed to win this coming weekend, as well as an outsider. So someone we think is going to win, but it's bigger odds with our friends at SBK than their opponents. We're tracking how we do as the season goes on. It's one point for a correct banker, two points for an outsider. Whoever loses has to do a forfeit, which will be a CrossFit workout for myself, while Justin has to do a nice old coach trip from Sunderland to Plymouth and back. And the current scores are 33-20 to myself. Both Justin and my bankers came in last week, but no luck with either of our outsiders. So I maintained my 13 point lead. But time is running out for Justin to try and claw that back. Let's see if he has any luck this weekend. What is your banker, JP? The optimism is flowing through me. I've gone with Leeds to win at home to Preston. Um, Leeds want revenge. They want revenge for that Boxing Day defeat, don't they? It was rage-inducing, frustrating defeat at Deepdale. And I think it hurt Leeds and I think it hurt Farker as well because he lost the following game to West Brom. Um, and there's a lot of doubt that throw in. Obviously, the, Mes- uh, the, the, the Meslier red card as well changed the game significantly. Leeds were just flat in that game. Struggled to break down a low block and alarm bells were ringing. Um, so I think it's a, a, a big, big game for Leeds um, just to get... Just to, get the confidence going and get this run going as well because they've won three games in a row since um, since the West Brom defeat just after the Preston game. That includes the FA Cup. Patrick Bamford's finding the net. They kept three clean sheets in that time as well. Um, and they're coming up against Preston side who have picked up just 15 points from a possible 39 away from home. Ryan Lowe under pressure. Just everything points to a Leeds win. But how many times have we said that this year? Well, that's what I was going to say, Justin. I mean, everything points to a Leeds win, doesn't it? Preston's form and Leeds just being simply a much better team. And they seem to have turned a corner again after going through a bit of a sticky patch. However, you must have had it in the back of your mind when you made this selection that, A, they lost to Preston not too long ago. And also, Leeds do have a tendency to put in a very underwhelming performance. Yeah, they've won... But the last three games that they won, they've won, they've won three 0 So they've scored nine goals, conceded zero, um, and that just gives me a lot of um, not motivation, but trust in that Daniel Farker is not going to let that 
um, inconsistency and complacency sneaking again. But like we said, it has happened. But now is the time to, to get a run going, to keep the pressure on Ipswich, to keep the pressure on Southampton and say, look, we're still in this. We are uh, we are here. I nearly caught you Kevin Keegan then. Didn't want to. Avoided it. <laughs> we're still in this. We're still in this. Um and, and and they are they've got a good they've got a good squad they've got a good side they've got one of the best starting 11s in the division if not the the best um there will be debate around that for a while but you've got to be winning these games you've got to be and that's they've where the expectation lies they've got to be but we've said that many a time this season just in and <laughs> Leeds have had a habit of shooting themselves in the foot constantly haven't they who knows maybe Brian Lowe has got Daniel Farker's number it may be mm. a thing that happens sometimes that just these weird quirks happen in football don't they where a manager just can't get one over someone and uh, that exactly. may be the case here. So we shall see. Time for Fargo to prove us wrong on that front, isn't it? My banker for the weekend is Middlesbrough to beat Rotherham. And the reason I've gone for that is firstly because there seems to be a renewed sense of optimism at Middlesbrough. So far, the season as a whole has been a bit underwhelming. But it's been a good couple of weeks. First of all, with the signing of Finazaz, a move we're both very excited by Justin. And then they gave Villa a good game in the FA Cup. Villa took a late goal from them to try and get past Borough. And then, of course, got an excellent win against Chelsea in the first leg of the Carabao Cup. And then they beat Millwall at the weekend in the league, just gone as well. So it's been a really good couple of weeks from a Borough perspective and they also seem like they're having a go at it in this transfer window as well of course we mentioned Finazaz they had been linked with Amad Diallo although that seems to have been rubbish now by Amad Diallo himself which doesn't happen very often and <laughs> um, but it, it seems like they're preparing for a real crack at getting back in the top six because they seem to be linked with quite a few players and that just goes to show the kind of optimism that's building around Middlesbrough after what we say has been a flat start to the season and they should keep the momentum going by beating Rotherham simply put Rotherham are just very poor and as we say we have virtually relegated them already they are particularly awful away from home it's just three points on their travels all season I'm just I haven't got any you know proof behind this Justin but we must be getting towards one of the worst away records we've ever seen at this level mustn't it um, it's been 437 days since they last won an away God. game <laughs> so there's absolutely no reason why that record is going to change this weekend so it should be a Middlesbrough win I think everyone should be expecting that yeah, um, <laughs> I, to be honest, I've got exactly the same thing written in my notes because I've literally said possibly one of the worst away sides we've seen in the championship ever. It's got to be yet to win a game, as you're saying, drawn just three games, scored just eight goals, scored just eight goals away from home. Yeah. Uh, hey, but, um, but there's something just holding me back from being really confident, mainly because of the reverse fixture on, uh, I think it was Boxing Day. Um we saw Victor Johansson have a masterclass in goal and it was that Cohen Bramon goal, wasn't it, where he yeah. scored from across. So Yeah, so that, <laughs> if my memory serves me correctly, Michael Carrick said something along the lines of, that's the first game I've ever played in football where we've lost without conceding a shot. And uh, <laughs> that was essentially what happened because as you say, Rotherham, had, Rotherham were awful that day but scored from a yeah. fluky cross by Cohen Bramon and then Victor Johansson was man of the match. So it was one yeah. of those games. That shouldn't be the case here. You would have thought, though. I don't know. Can you imagine the odds on Rotherham winning again with a clean sheet without surely having not. a shot on target? It would be incredible, but um, it surely can't happen. As you say, Rotherham, one of the worst sides away from home we've seen in the Championship ever, in my opinion. Statistically, they're probably going to be back up, uh, be backed up at some point. The only thing as well, Middlesbrough do struggle at home. They lost the last uh, three of the last four. Um, so there may be some seeds of doubt, but... Again, one of the worst away sides in the Championship ever should see them over the line. Yeah, and if they are going to be realistic about getting in the top six, this is a game they simply have to win. Otherwise, they may as well just knock that thought on the head straight away. Yeah. So there are mine and Justin's two bankers for the weekend. And every week, we combine these two selections with a bet on the full-time result of our game of the weekend to create our very own second tier featured multiple with SBK. So this week, we're going for Leeds and Middlesbrough, both to win. And then full-time result from the game of the weekend, which is Stoke v Birmingham, to be 
a draw. And a £10 bet on that returns £58 with SBK. So you can create your own multiple with three or more bets on the full-time result of any game from across the Championship. T's and C's apply over 18s only. And please do gamble responsibly. That again is Leeds and Middlesbrough both to win and then Stoke v Birmingham to be a draw. £10 returns £58 with SBK. Justin, let's go on to our outsiders. What is yours, big boy? I've gone with Watford to win away at Bristol City. I'm, you know what, I'm, I'm well behind Watford at the moment because they've low-key gone under the, well, I say low-key, gone under the radar, it's the same thing, but they've gone under the radar. They really have. They've, they've set their sight on the top six under Ishmael. Um, and they look like they're, they're almost cleaning house because I've seen a few players linked away with moves who haven't quite featured in their first team. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Nonetheless, looking at this game against Bristol City, do you know Watford have played 18 uh, since the start of October, lost just four? which is actually quite an impressive record. And again, yeah. that's what I mean. They've gone under the radar. Away from home, they've become monsters as well. They've got the fourth best away record in the division. And they're coming off the back of a, a hard-fought win against QPR, where they should have won by more. And seemingly, Jake Livermore turned into to- Tony Boa, just hitting worldies <laughs> from outside the box. Um, it was incredible. Uh, now, Bristol have improved under Liam Manning and, and, and look far more convincing than they did under Nigel Pearson. But these are the games at Watford. It seems to lead pushing for automatics Watford need to win if they're going to stand a chance of pushing into the top six because Bristol City again will have aspirations of it and if you can put away a team um, who are who are you know setting their sights on a top half finish or, or, or top six finish it's going to be a tricky game but you know you should see yourselves as a line but look Watford have been great they're keeping clean sheets defensively they're sound and they're taking chances as well it's worth you know bringing them into the conversation over the next few weeks about their you know chances of finishing top six, but they've got to win these games. Well, you say that um, it, well, Watford haven't lost many games recently, and you're right, they, they have been very good at avoiding defeat. The teams that they've lost to in the past, how long is it now, since November, did you say? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. Leicester, Ipswich, you know what, fine. And then Bristol City, of all teams, of course. <laughs> Bristol City beat them 4-1 on their own turf at Vicarage Road. So it seems like, you know, if that's anything to go by, then maybe that, considering it's now Watford away at Bristol City, that this may be one where Watford slip up again. And you, I'm sure when you made this selection, Justin, you may have been a bit nervous about Bristol City being on a bit of a high after their yeah, win against yeah. West Ham in the FA Cup. Yeah, I don't. I don't really. I, could, I don't count the FA Cup in, in form. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going fully for revenge arc. This week, I've gone with Leeds to get one over Preston and Watford to get one back over Bristol City. Because that was a weird game as well. It was, one of, was it one of Lee Mann's first games in charge? Um, I can't quite remember. But yeah, it's, it's one of those games where, um, again, Watford, they've got, they've got to be winning it. Um, and, and you are right. You know, Bristol City are going to be on a high. Um, they've got a good young squad. They, they made some interesting additions. Scott Twine coming in. Um, this week probably probably going to be involved in, in, in the game and then you've got Taylor Gordon Hickman as well coming in on the permanent so yeah it, it, they're going to be on a high but so are Watford Watford in probably better form and probably a little bit more you know used to the way Ishmael wants them to play Well you say Watford haven't lost many games in the past few months um, that is true however the reason why they're not higher in the table is because they draw a lot, Justin. So that's why I probably wouldn't be going for a Watford win here. In fact, I'd probably be signing for Bristol City if I had to sign for one of those two sides. Um, let's go to my outside. I've gone for Millwall to win away at QPR. I was a bit surprised to see QPR was favourites for this one, I've got to say, because they are painfully out of form. It's just two points from seven league games for Marty Sifuentes. The Marty party has completely fallen apart. At one point, it was a proper fiesta. Now, everything's on fire and Gareth Ainsworth has stolen your girlfriend. That's how the party's turned out for everyone involved at QPR. To be fair, I don't think they've been woeful during this seven league game run the results aren't coming and if things don't turn around soon then their chances of staying up will fade away quite quickly however I think they can possibly take a bit of encouragement from how they have been playing but look you know results haven't been going well 
results have been going well for Millwall. They've got three, they had three wins on the bounce under Joe Edwards before losing in the cup to Leicester, which you know we can let them off with, and then against Middlesbrough in the league last weekend as well. They lost as well, but they do seem to have turned a corner. So we'll fancy their chances of getting a win here against a pretty torridly out of form QPR side. Rather characteristically, Millwall are also in pretty decent. Um, form away from home. They've got the seventh best away record in the league. Conversely, QPR have by far the worst home record. So this is a great opportunity for Millwall to get a big three points against London rivals, no less, Justin. I think a big thing as well you need to take into account is QPR are terrible at defending set pieces. They are woeful at defending set pieces. And stereotypically, you'd expect Millwall to take advantage of that um, if, if they're going to get something from this. Because away games typically, you know, it doesn't always go your way. But considering that um, QPR have collected just nine points at home this season, struggle, they struggle to create. And as I say, they concede a lot from, from set pieces. Yeah, Millwall wouldn't will, will, will be licking their lips, but they will be in good spirits. They will be licking their lips, Justin. The Lions will be purring at the thought of getting three points here. Purring. A lion purring. That's um, that's quite disconcerting. Not disconcerting, it's quite cute, actually. Um, I don't think you want a lion to be purring going into this game because it's, it's not very... It's, you know, I'm sure you don't fear. if you're a QPR fan. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you definitely don't want to be playing with you either because you know they can get can get quite scary. Um, but look, uh, Millwall keep on <laughs> clean sheets, back to back clean sheets away from home as well. And obviously, you need to bounce back from that home Borough defeat uh, last weekend. Jaffa Tinganga is coming into the side as well. He's going to bring that Premier League experience, bit of extra you know, versatility and mobility as well in the back line, which um, QPR won't be big fans of because they do lack mobility other than Sinclair Armstrong in the final third. Um, they I'll lack, they lack anything in the final third, really, don't they, at the yeah, moment? They, they, like, they lack spark, they lack um, substance in the final third, which is a great shame, really, because we saw some spark of um, life from Sif Winters uh, in, uh, in the early stages. As you say, that party's, that party's dwindled massively. But, yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to count for, for QPR here. But, again, fighting against relegation, anything can happen. Yes, it certainly can, but I don't think it will here. Now, it, now it's time for this. Finn's still with us. Yeah, Millwall have got the second most goals from set pieces. Yeah, I, I would have searched that myself, but when I'm on the MacBook mic, the um, tappy tappy. Cla- yeah, it becomes a lot louder, which is very annoying. Really need to find a thing if I can, an adapter. <clears throat> Yes, it's time for Scott High or Ryan Lowe. And this is the game. What are you laughing at? I felt so high-pitched. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> should, should I read the whole of the Scott High or Ryan Lowe intro in a high voice? It's time for Scott High or Ryan Lowe. This is the game where we have to rank four things from highest to lowest. It's as simple as that. Sound like Mickey Mouse. Ha <laughs> ha. There's three questions. This week Jesus I'm providing Christ. the questions for Justin. Are you ready, PG? Yeah, but please, please scale it back. Please oh. back. <laughs> um, these are the four teams who won the most points in the championship across 2023 as a calendar year. Rank them in order of who won the most points, Justin. Coventry, Middlesbrough, Sunderland, West Brom. Oh, Coventry's ability to um, shoot themselves in the foot early on in the season is going to hold them back. I'm going to go with West Brom. Okay. Sunderland Coventry and um, Middlesbrough I tell you what that is impressive because you have, could have not got that more wrong if you really? tried yes really? that was completely all over the place uh, Middlesbrough were top with 75 points You've got to remember how good they were in the second half of last season yeah Justin. but they dropped off towards the end of the season and they had a yeah, for like this four games, well. though. It was four yeah, games. Yeah, but it's four games. It's four games. It matters a lot in this. Um, West Brom was second with 73. Um, Coventry were third with 70. And then Sunderland, 69. I was a bit surprised Sunderland was so low. Yeah, that is weird. Don't, yeah. I, I can't really call them dropping off in form too badly, uh, like Middlesbrough did um, in the second half of last season. Mm. And they started this season pretty, pretty okay. 
Yeah. Bizarre. Yeah. Anyway. It is a bit bizarre. Life. That is life. Right. This is the exact opposite, Justin. Justin, these are the four teams who won the fewest points in the championship across 2023 as a calendar year, but were also in the championship for both this season and last season. So I want you to rank them on who's won the fewest points in 2023. Fewest to highest, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, Birmingham, QPR, Rotherham, Stoke. QPR. Stoke. Not sure how Huddersfield aren't in there, by the way. I will, I will say that. <laughs> Neil Warnock, that's why. Um, so you want fewest to highest? Yes, please. Yeah, so QPR, Stoke. Um, sorry, it was Rotherham and who else? Birmingham. Yeah, QPR, Stoke, Birmingham. Where are you putting Rotherham then? Rotherham, Top. highest? Yeah, because they did have a very good second half of last season. Not as good as you think, seemingly, Justin. Um, that was wrong. QPR were bottom with 36 points. Rotherham were second with 40. Just dropped my pen. Um, Birmingham were third with 49. And Stoke were bottom but top of this list, if you know what I mean. At 51 points they got in 2023. When? <laughs> they, when? They, they have a habit of just being like not as bad as everyone else, don't they? Like Just consistently poor yeah. but at no point ever really exceedingly atrocious if that makes sense yeah. no that makes sense it's a good it's a good question actually um well, thank yeah, you. A different different ways of thinking about that one well there you go then uh, and the final one justin is from the world of film here's four quentin tarantino films i want you to rank them by which one has the highest rating on rotten tomatoes those films are django on chains inglorious bastards Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs. Now, this is based on the tomato meter, which is based off the opinions of film critics, not the audience, which I think is an important point to add. Mm. What are you going for, Justin? I'll go with Reservoir Dogs first. I think that's his best film, by the way, if I'm going to add an opinion in there. Um, I agree. I'm going to go Reservoir Dogs first. Then I'll go with Inglorious Bastards. Then I'll go to Django and then Pulp Fiction. Justin, you've pretty much nailed it, except you've massively underrated Pulp Fiction for some reason. I can't believe you put that why. bottom. Why yeah, have I you done Pulp, that? Yeah, I love Pulp Fiction, but I just think because Django's a little bit newer um, and we know what Tarantino is all about by that film, by, by the time that film comes out, then maybe you know, it, it'd have favoured it a bit, a bit more. No, bit more. You, completely, completely honestly wrong. Pulp Fiction, 92%, was just top. Reservoir Dogs, 90%. Inglorious Bastards, 89%. Django Unchained, 87%. So you basically had it spot on, except you should have put Pulp Fiction top, and I don't know why you didn't. Savage. Yeah, no, it's, um, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. It was a, a huge error. Um, it's a great film. It's a bloody great film. It watch is. it. Every time it's on as well, it's one of those, I just, I just, I just watch it. Just yeah. stick well, it on you, you've it. got to. It is film gold isn't it and i don't know why you discussed it, it was disgraced it so much justin um there we go that's scott higher ryan though and this has been the second tier podcast this has been our preview show with sbk and we'll next be back on sunday to review all the games in the championship this coming weekend so we bloody look forward to seeing you then this has been the second tier podcast i've been ryan dilks i've been justin peach and a big thank you for listening. <laughs>